having many sessions about the, the Holy Ghost of God, talking about the, the things that makes for the essence of the life that God has given us to where we are able to get beyond just an intellectual knowledge, but get into an experience and begin to understand that we're not dealing with religion, we're dealing with a living God. Thank you, Lord. We're dealing with a living reality of the life of God himself that he's put in us. We've been looking at the, the Holy Ghost and we looked yesterday in the other session about um, the person of the Holy Ghost. We're going to review that very quickly um, knowing that when we are talking about the presence of God in our life, it's not just some kind of a mystical thing that is there by faith. Uh, there is no faith for the indwelling presence of the Holy Ghost. Once he showed up, faith for that was done away with. Faith had accomplished its purpose. God now has taken up residence inside you, and scripturally speaking, he's there forever. Amen. What God has linked us into and locked us into, what we find out that uh, God's intent from before the foundations of the earth was to have exactly what he has. That's why we are called temples of the Holy Ghost of God. Uh, we are the one who has been selected in the earth and working in harmony with God that we now have become the house individually in the house collectively of God. Amen? Amen. So that anywhere we are, he is. Now, we use this building as a meeting place, but we're the church. I mean, we're the house of God. We're that dwelling place of God. This building could never be holy, but you sure are. Amen? Amen. By design, God made it that way, but we there's things that we would do to ourselves we'd never do in this building. But the thing is, is that God wants us to become more aware and more alert that he is ever-present, dwelling as a being and a person. And we looked at that yesterday uh, a lot uh, in showing the things that really uh, reveals to us. Come on, I need some cooperation here. Not sure how far back I went. Well... Okay, some of the functions uh, of the Holy Ghost and the way that Jesus described it as we looked at yesterday is that there's terms and functions that the Holy Ghost carries out which identifies him completely as being a person. Uh, he actually entered in it and took the role that Jesus had with us showing that as Jesus was comforter, uh, while he was here, the consolation of Israel. Now the Holy Ghost is that consolation, that comforter, working in us, but act, which actually makes us a consolation as well. So it's pretty incredible to think of God, but the Holy Ghost speaks, and we looked at that. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. They ministered to the Lord in the past, and the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. In Acts 13, 2, in 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Revelation 2, 7, 11, 17, 29. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. Amen? <clears throat> now we look at that and we realize the Spirit is speaking all the time. He's working in your life, communicating with you. And the more that we are able to really grasp his presence and his being, the more we're able to relate to him. And I believe that um, a lot of times our own actions really can indicate that we don't believe as a person the Holy Ghost is with us because if, if we did, we wouldn't be looking out we would be looking in. Are you with me? Here. We keep looking for some kind of a distant message to come instead of that communication already being locked in permanently on the internal. 
It's kind of like if your phone rings and you run to the door and open the door to get that communication. It's like, I don't think you really know what's going on here. Or if somebody knocks on the door and you pick up your phone, it's like, what's going on? You know, well, the Holy Ghost of God, God himself is within us speaking and communicating with us. And if we're not careful, we'll catch ourselves listening out here for what's going on in here. We, we are that tent of meeting that God had intended so that others can actually come to Mark or Miss Doris or Teresa or Lee or whoever. And they when they meet with you, they can actually meet with God. Because he's ever present in your life. I think probably one of the most distinguishing things about whether they're going to meet with God or not is are you aware that it's Christ in you? That is God in you. If, if not, then you're probably going to project an opinion. Some kind of soulish mm -hmm. wisdom, natural wisdom. But if you are already aware of the ever-present life of God in you and the communication that He has with you, when they come to you seeking Him, they're not going to find you. They're going to find Him. Amen. Amen. And that's what we all want. I hope that's what you want. If not, shame on you. We, we all need... For God to be the one that's alive in here, communicating, touching through this vessel, doing all the things that God wants to do. We, we've had our time in this body. Now he's saying, give me a little time. Let me show you what I can do, and then you let me know what you like the best. <coughs> do you like what you were doing, or do you like what I can do through that thing? Well, part of the thing that he's doing is speaking, and we, we're, we looked at that, and some of the other things... Are he searches all things, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. He reveals or inspires holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I mean, revelation doesn't come by your human intellect. I, I don't care how much natural knowledge you have. It's not going to give you spiritual revelation. Natural knowledge. Everything reproduces of its own kind. You can have all the natural wisdom and intellect that you want to have, but it's not going to bring spiritual revelation. If that was the case, just anybody could memorize the Bible, and, and they'd have all the revelation that could ever come from the Godhead. But that's not the way it works. You can have only one scripture verse and get revelation from the Holy Ghost on it, and you would have more than somebody could quote the whole Bible. Here. Amen? One living word is worth all of the non-living words put together. So when we know that he's revealing, he's the one that's fire. We, we are there to be workmen, not to be ashamed, rightly dividing. That's all perfect and, and, and well. But at some point, as you are gathering in the intellectual knowledge that comes from the scriptures or anything else, at some point, you have to engage the Holy Ghost of God in that understanding or in that knowledge to get true understanding and then once you get true understanding of that intellectual knowledge then you need wisdom which will show you how to apply it amen so they work together and and the holy ghost of god's the one that's in us god didn't want you to, to in your mind to think you've got to get to a church building where people are coming together in order to reach him He's took up residence in us, so it doesn't matter if you're chained to the prison, in the prison, or if you're out walking down the street, or if you're working in the back 40, hoeing corn. I mean, whatever's going on, he wanted you to know whenever you have that question or you have that need, he is present with you there to bring it. Hear it. Amen? Yes. So he reveals, he inspires, he teaches, of course. Uh, John 14, 26, the Holy Ghost of the Father will send to my name, shall teach you all things, bring all things to your remembrance. He cries out in us, Abba, Father. Uh, he intercedes for us, making intercession with groanings that can't be uttered. He calls and places uh, men and women in service, uh, just like in Acts 13, where he said, separate me, Barnabas, and Saul, for the work where I call them. He leads, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I think a lot of times people don't understand that the Scripture is trying to reveal things not to be exclusive, but to be inclusive. That what he's really, when he says here, he 
For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, that's the sons of God. Now, I believe that when he said that, I think he meant that. Don't, don't you think he meant that? You think he just threw it out there so we would chew on it and, and try to you know reason away, around with it? He said, no, if, as a matter of fact, in other places, if you don't have his spirit, you're none of his. And he said, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be, the spirit of God dwells in you. Amen. How many knows you can have the spirit of God dwelling in you, but that does not mean you are going to yield, let, and permit him to lead you. Yeah. Now, God's speaking a very particular thing when he talks about sons of God. And, and I, I love the scripture verse because it's challenging. Romans 8, 14 is very challenging because it says, for, many, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, those are the sons of God. That's the ones to look for. So the actual manifestation of the seed of God is going to be seen in those who are being led by the Spirit and not necessarily just those who call upon the name. Amen? I think yes. we can agree not everybody who is called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to make Him Savior are submitting and yielding and walking to a degree we'd say that's a son of God right there or that's a daughter of God right there. Now we all want to achieve the levels that Christ has for us. I mean, would it not be awesome to hear the Father not only say well done, thou good and faithful servant, but to be able to say Everything that you've given me to do, Father, I've done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and not just be pleasing to the flesh, but actually be coming right out of the spirit of truth that you have. Now, I believe that as we are maturing into what is referred to here, we want to walk in that sonship or that child level in God that not a, a, a potty on or a toddler, but we want to walk in that state of a fully matured one who's able to reproduce. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You're not going to see no baby crawling on the floor ready to reproduce. They have the, the potential, but they're not matured to that yet. Well, we want to be the fully matured ones. Uh, and Potier is that name, and you see that, or Pater, well, you see that in the uh, Greek. And what it's actually talking about is that you are fully matured, ready to be a parent. Now, we need to reach that state, and basically what's revealed here by Paul, or the Holy Ghost through Paul, is that if you will let the Holy Ghost of God lead you, you will reach parenthood. Amen? Now, that, I mean, that's an awesome thing. I, I believe to me, to me, parenthood in Christ means the things that Jesus did, you can do also. Yeah. Now, that's not just some shot at the rainbow that we run after till we lay this flesh down and go on to be with the Lord. I believe that it's not only achievable, I believe it's a righteous expectation by God that those who will yield and be led by the Spirit will reach that point. Hallelujah. Just because we're not seeing uh, an extreme uh, level of maturity where that is occurring, we see bits and pieces of the things that Jesus did appear in our lives and the lives of those around us. Well, we need to allow that to accumulate. Yes. It needs to be collectively able to manifest through us so that when people come to us, they come righteously expecting. If they come to read it, they don't want to just come to get a nice scripture. They want to come and be healed. They want to come and be delivered. If they show up with Miss Teresa, they, they want to receive what Christ is capable of bringing to the table. They don't want our best effort. They want Christ's best effort. Here, here. Amen? And, and that's, that's what the Holy Ghost is capable of doing. And as being led by His Spirit, we have the reassurance here in Romans 8 that that is exactly what God will do. If you will yield and will let the Spirit lead you, you will mature not only intellectually, but you'll mature spiritually and, and manifestly in Christ so that we are extremely confident in the one who's living inside of us. Amen? Hallelujah. It's just like John said, I must decrease and he must increase. And that, that, in a nutshell, that's where we're at. But we're Amen. trying to 
We are trying to survive. We are trying to keep self alive and try to incorporate things we're learning and stuff into our life. And I, I believe the, the better process is what Jesus wanted us to do, which was to be totally baptized. Let that circumcision of the heart take place by the Spirit, the cutting away of the flesh. So the fleshly goals kind of fell out, yes. fall out, and are left in the water. And the ones that come out of there are the desires of God. Amen. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. He also rules. Uh, he creates. The Spirit of God has made me. He sanctifies. He helps. We looked at all these yesterday. He gives gifts. He works miracles. He bears witness. He reproves. He regenerates. He guides into truth. I think I put that up there twice. He glorifies Christ. He strives with men. Yep, he guides into truth. He sends. He directs men in service. He issues commands. He has fellowship or communion. He speaks to the churches. He comforts. Amen? Mm -hmm. he, all of these things are things you would expect a person to do. And we need to realize that we don't just have some type of a pinpoint extension from God Himself that touches us. We have a person. Thank you, Lord. Amen? We have a person dwelling in this being. And we shared briefly yesterday, and I just want to reiterate, is that if, you, if you're driving down the road and you've got a person in the car with you, you should be consciously aware, I'm not alone. Mm. Amen? Yes. Yes. There's somebody else here. And if you, if you know that that person with you has the answer and the information, the knowledge or the skill level or whatever it is that you need to intervene in your life, we would be foolish to look anywhere else but where he is. Amen? Yes. Well, why would we drive down the road or try to call somebody on the phone when we have that the all-knowing one living right inside of us? Amen. I, I think that the reason we want to get that confirmation from somebody else is we're not confident that we're in a relationship good enough that we can understand that that's him. That's it. There's people that call you on the phone. They don't have to say, hey, this is Lee. When you hear the phone, when you hear their voice, you know who it is. You don't have to introduce yourself when you call a close friend. When, when they hear that voice, they say, hey, how you doing? Looking for someone blessed of the Lord, right? Yes. I mean, those are the types of things that we need to develop with the Holy Ghost. So that when He speaks, we, we don't have to say, Lord, was that you? Well, of course it was. Why? Because you know His voice. My sheep hear my voice, and they know me. They love me, and I love them. And they will not listen to the other voices because they know my voice, love my voice, and understand that my voice is the voice of truth. Amen? So we have all of these things that's identifying and showing that he is not just very personal, but he is a person. And that he is indwelling in our lives, and we need to begin to relate to him uh, in that so that we can benefit from the things that he has to offer. The Holy Spirit's a person also because he has personal feelings ascribed to him. He can be grieved. Amen. How many of those it's? Can't, this thing can't be grieved. No. I could beat it with a sledgehammer. And it wouldn't be grieved, would it? Grieved is, is that emotional thing that comes over from sorrow, etc. It, it, animate objects or inanimate objects don't have that stuff. Living people and persons have that stuff. And the Holy Spirit can be grieved, vexed, or rebelled against, insulted. Lied to? Mm. Amen? How many times you got in trouble lying to a wall? Mm. Hey, wall, you're not really a wall. I hate <laughs> to break the news to you. You're a floor. You know what I mean? It, it would be stupid to even think that there would be any kind of relativity to that. The other part of the whole thing is that when they lied to the uh, disciples, uh, when they brought the Ananias and Sapphira, they reveal, oh yeah, you see me as a person, but you're not lying to me. You're lying to the Holy Ghost. And how many knows there was a penalty 
for that. Uh, a, a very dire penalty, actually. Uh, it costs them their lives. Now, that happens because you're not just lying to a person or lying to a, a manifestation or an extension of the Spirit. They were literally lying to God. Mm -hmm. And they lied to God at the temple of God because the disciples were the temple of the Holy Ghost. And here they come. And I'm, I mean, there is a severity in that relationship uh, and a discipline that I don't think most of Christianity would even swallow today. I don't think they'd even believe that something like that could happen. That say you sold property for $100,000 and you brought 90000 in and just give it to the church. And they say, well, you know, is that all there? You go, well, I don't, I wanted to keep the tent, but I don't want to feel bad, you know. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's all we got. Bam, you fall dead. I mean, are you kidding me? Now, that would be nonsensical to us. It wouldn't make any sense at all. And we would wonder why that was so important. It wasn't important whether it was 90000 or 100000 The importance was is that they thought it was better to hold in union with the flesh. And instead of offending the flesh, they chose to offend God. There it is. Their, their flesh would have been, well, we sold it for 100000 but we kept 10000 back. We needed food. We're going to have to travel, and we've got all these needs. There's no lie in that. There's no offense. But they chose to appease the flesh and lie to God. And in that particular time, in that particular place, it was intolerable. Mm. And it cost them their life. Now, who knows if any of us are in those circumstances at any time. But I think it, it would be a good practice to deny the flesh and be truthful with God. Yes. Amen. Amen. Now, I, I understand that, you know, in in something we, we believe we confess all these things to God, and we do, and He forgives us, which He does. His love is there. His mercy is there. And it's awesome. But there's some other things that should be a positive thing for us that we actually wrestle with. Just like possibly Ananias and Sapphira probably wrestled with whether to tell the disciples that was all it was or if that was a portion. We wrestle with the things that God says about us. The things that God has honored us with. The things God has glorified and blessed us with. We wrestle with those things and instead of accepting the, the blessing that our Father has given us. I mean, think about it. In John 17, <coughs> Jesus said, Father, the glory that you have given me, I have given them. You think about that. We're not talking about getting uh, 12 popsicles and you're going to share them with the disciples. We're talking about the honor, the reverence, the praise that was poured out upon Jesus in the glory, the intrinsic eternal perfections of God manifesting. Everything that makes God God, He poured out on Jesus. And Jesus said, Father, that that you've given me, I have given them. Mm. So that they can be one with us. Now that's that's an important thing. Don't, don't think that you could ever make yourself equal with God, but don't deny the work that the Father did to make you equal or one with Him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Because if we do, it, it's I know it's an extreme other end, not lying about keeping money back, which is more important, lying about whether you kept part of the money back or lying uh, about who God says that you are. Mm. I mean, there's some extreme things. And, and I believe that as we begin to let the Holy Ghost continue to reveal within our being, we will find ourselves agreeing more and more with God. And the more we do agree with God, the more the truth and that spirit of truth and the life of that truth is going to begin to radiate through our being. And I believe in the midst of that, what we're going to find out is that we're going to not only accept the things that God is saying about us, but we'll accept the things that He has said, and we will allow Him to direct our paths into paths that are even unknown at this time. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ever ask or think. Amen? According to the what? The power that dwells within us. It's already in here. In other words, 
If you think you're extreme and on the radical end of things of God, you've not even probably got through the front door yet. Uh, I mean, let's look, if you look back, and I don't want to go through the whole thing, but just look back through the scripture and see how radical God is. He challenged all the governments. He challenged all the things. And, and, and even today, uh, when they were going in to take the land, God wanted them to own the land. Mm. And, and he wanted them to have it purely, and he wanted to protect them, so he told them, don't make a covenant with anybody in the land. Utterly drive them out from before you. Amen. Don't let any of them stay because he knew that a little leaven could leaven the whole lump. Now, I, I understand that that's a natural application uh, for a nation and things that were going on, but how much more important is it for the spiritual nation then? Mm. That we don't compromise and we don't uh, make any covenant with the flesh or any others if they're lying against the truth. At some point, we have to accept that God is true and everything else is a lie. Your interpretation of the Scripture is irrelevant. His interpretation of the Scripture is very relevant. Yes, sir. Amen? Because if we all took a Scripture and took it aside and wrote what it meant, we may come out of there with, with dozens of different things. But when you allow the Holy Ghost in you to look at that Scripture and tell you what that Scripture means, you're coming out of there with truth. You don't go in there looking, trying to prove your side. You go in there trying to find God's side. Are you with me? Yeah. It's very important because it, it, it doesn't matter in, in the long run whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong. What does matter is, did I say what he said? Yes. If I'm right, I probably said what he said. And if I'm wrong, I probably said what I wanted to believe or what I thought. But we, as we engage it, we understand that there is a spiritual realm. There's an invisible realm. Everything visible was made from that which is invisible. Now that makes the, not the natural the origin, but actually the invisible. What, what we look at and, and see here came from something that couldn't be seen. Amen. So the things that are out there, we have to understand that God sees things we don't even have a clue about. And when we are in a situation, how many's ever been in a situation you didn't think there's any way you're going to get out of? It? Mm. Yet here you are. Yeah. You know why? Because the invisible can see everything in the visible. The invisible knows how to operate the visible. God takes nothing and can make something out of it. And you see, that's when we get into that side <laughs> and that way of thinking, we begin to understand that. What God's capable of doing, He has now made available in you. Amen? Yeah. What did Jesus say? Nothing is impossible to you if you can only believe. believe. Amen. You can say to that mountain. I, I mean, how many of you ever seen do it? Just walk over and talk to a mountain. Be thou removed and cast into the sea. And not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you have said will come to pass. You'll have whatsoever you have said. I've never seen somebody just speak to a mountain. I've seen dynamite hit a mountain. I've seen dozers hit mountains. And I've seen them move. But to see a word hit a mountain. Mm. Mm. And it moves. Mm. See, that's a whole different way Lord. of thinking. You see, the way Jesus conveyed that to us was that if you say to that mountain, not that you, you go up and dig it up, but He said, if you say to that mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea and not doubt in your heart, but believe, that what you have said is going to come to pass. You will have whatsoever you have said. Mm -hmm. Now that's incredible. Mark 11, 22, 23, 24. Jesus is talking about having faith in God or having the God kind of faith. And that's what he was trying to explain to them is that faith is not something that you have on a credit card that you just try to hang on to. Faith is the actual result of believing the truth. Mm -hmm. That the word is truth. And when the word comes... The Word contains the faith within it to produce whatever that Word is. And when you engage that Word with believing, you release the faith that goes into motion then to actually bring in every ingredient of the formula it takes to bring to pass whatever that Word was. Amen? 
So it's, it's not like that you can whip a critic, oh, I want that blue chair over there. Here's my faith. Can you give me that chair? <laughs> it's, it's not like that. Or here, uh, I want her healed right here's my faith card. I, I want her healed. No. You see, it's in what God says is, is the one that contains the faith. When you make his word yours and it's alive in you, his faith now has become your faith. But it's not your faith, it's his faith. Here. Amen. Amen. So as he begins to reveal to us what we're capable of, what we are potentially able to accomplish, we can find ourselves wrestling against that truth which hinders us but also hinders God from accomplishing what it is he wants to do. So we need to be careful on how we hear but realize that the person who is, has taken up residence inside of you is not just a person, it is God. Amen? Amen. He can be spoke to, he can be heard from. Amen? Amen. He can be yielded to. If, if you walk into a situation, I, I mean, God has, has utilized this vessel, I've seen him do it, raise three, four people from the dead. I, and, and it blew my mind. I didn't go in there with faith, I went in there with Christ in me. I went in there physically afraid or downhearted, but it never bothered him at all. Mm, here. He just said, hey, uh, say this. Hey, say this. Hey, do that. Amen? Because you see, he's the one. He's the key. It doesn't matter if anybody thinks... You're the best speaker or the worst speaker. The best singer or the worst singer. If you're the best prayer or the worst prayer. I, I would rather have somebody that didn't pray at all as long as they yielded to the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. I, I don't think God has to say anything to get things done. He sure doesn't have to pray point one, point two, and point three to get something done. He, Jesus wanted that guy with, with blind eyes. He just takes some mud packs and slings it on his eye. That don't take a lot of word. Amen? Sling it on there. And then he didn't say, Be healed in my name. He just simply said, How do you see now? Well, I got these mud packs in my eyes. But actually, he could see better. Amen? You see, the one inside you is the one that was inside him. Hear it, hear it. It's the same one. It, it's not one like it. it. It's not a down payment of that one that's going to come one day. We won't need that then. We will be one in entirety because we are spirit now the Holy Ghost is here teaching us and revealing and opening up to us exactly who we are and what we are capable of being and doing Amen. he already knows that you can raise the dead he already knows that you can walk on water he already knows you can lay hands on the sick he's trying to convince us yes, yes. what we've got to do is, is put self aside and not worry about reputation. Don't worry about your uh, all these things that we might be trying to build our own little kingdom. And let's get about the kingdom of God. Yes, let's get about the life of God yes. and let the Christ who's in us do the things he's, he's capable of doing. He's revealing to us more and more that He is really there. And it's sad, I guess, to think about it that He actually has to get down to that. To where He said, I'm really here. I really am. Amen? Amen? I mean, our behavior, our behavior a lot of times will, will reveal to us that we really don't think He's there. If you go off and cuss somebody out, or you go do something you know you shouldn't do, you're actually, if, he, if you knew and could visibly see Him standing right there, you would never do it. Amen? But we do it, and later we go, oh Lord, forgive me. <laughs> and, and, and the reason is because we have not yet broke through that tent or that veil to where we have crossed from a place of intellectual knowledge into a place of revelation. Yes, Lord. Intellectual knowledge you can forget or don't remember all the time. It'll come back to you, then you try to correct what was it wrong. But revelation is alive inside of you. Amen? It, it's just a way of being. It's like riding a bicycle. You know, you can jump on it and go. So, in any case, he can be blasphemed, resisted, 
put to the test, quenched, provoked. Amen? The, these are feelings and things that are ascribed to the Holy Ghost. We looked already and saw that Jesus called him him. The scripture said he, himself. I mean, all these things were referring using very personal pronouns and, and, and that were masculine and not neuter. If they're neuter, then it's it or that. And, and But when it's masculine, uh, when you're using a non-gender form, it's still going to be masculine there. And what it simply says is he, he says, when he comes. Mm -hmm. or and, and what we see all through that, we looked at a lot of scripture yesterday about the ones that the Bible quotes, calls him, projecting him, he, uh, as being the one, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost of God. We see Jesus doing it. We see the disciples doing it because they realized they were not just messing with an influence. They were messing with a person. There was a person that was present and they uh, dealt with it that way. Now we looked already uh, at the things that uh, in the earlier section about uh, what the Holy Ghost is uh, up to what's going on, uh, showing that the things that he was saying, doing, performing, the way he was talked about, is the way a person is talked about. Also, he can be pleased. Amen. Now, obviously, the Holy Spirit is uh, associated directly with the Father and the Son. Showing, do you think the Father is a real person? Do you think the Son's a real person? Well, so is the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. He's addressed in the masculine pronouns. We need to treat it that way and walk in the revelation of that. Also, the Holy Spirit's a person because moral goodness is also ascribed to him. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them, Nehemiah 9 20. Uh, Psalm 143 10. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. And Matthew 19, 17, he said, uh, so he said to them, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. I, I think Jesus was prodding them a little bit. Are you calling me good because you know I'm God, or are you just trying to give me an ear pleaser? Are you just trying to say um, that I'm doing a good job, or do you really know who I am? And, and the revelation of who he was was more important to Jesus than them just saying good job, everybody. Amen. How many knows that if you're pleasing God, it doesn't matter if everybody's speaking evil of you. Yes, Lord. Just please God. I think you'll find out most of the time when God's bringing revelation, God's accomplishing and doing great things, even the ones He's helping a lot of times are kicking and screaming. Yes. Come on. And the ones that are doing it are, are in opposition to basically everything and everyone else that's in the world. Uh, because there's no glory for the world in it. It's all glory for God. Amen? The Holy Spirit is a person because various names are ascribed to Him that suggest that personality as well. Um, we, we looked at all of the things, we looked at a 20, 20 some odd things yesterday, I'm not sure exactly how many, uh, that referred to the Holy Spirit as that person and, and the things that described Him, which we talked about that as well, that the, the more of a description, if you don't see something, the more somebody is descriptive of it, the better a view of, of it you have. If I had something and you didn't know what it was and I start describing it to you, the more detail I give to you, the better picture I can paint, the more you can understand what it is that I do have and, and whether it would be beneficial and how it can be used. Uh, for instance, if I had a boat or something back here uh, and, and I started saying, well, you know, you can use this to fish in. It's, it's you know, 20 some odd feet long. It's, it's white. It floats. It's got a motor on it. The more I tell you, you say, oh, you got a boat. Well, same thing about the Holy Ghost. God's describing to us all of the different things that the Holy Spirit is capable of doing, uh, what He's like, 
uh, the things that can grieve him, the things that can please him, the things that can offend, the things, all these things he's showing is giving us a better picture of who it is we're in relationship with more and more. Because although he is invisible to the naked eye, he's not invisible to the spiritual eye. He's not invisible to the spiritual ear. Amen? So what did Jesus tell us about the Holy Spirit when he referred to him as the Comforter? One of the most enduring names or titles of the Holy Spirit used in, in the Scripture is that of Comforter. The Greek word parakletos. Paraklete is also rendered counselor, helper, or advocate. So Comforter, I, unfortunately, probably in, in Western terms, uh, if somebody's a comforter, they look at them as just being somebody that comes and, and kind of is there with you through a difficult time or something like that. Comforting you, trying to bring you into a more perfect emotional state. But comforter, as far as the scripture is, is a lot different. Counselor, helper, or advocate. Somebody that goes to bat for you. Amen? So when you look at Jesus, I mean, in your mind, think of all of the verses of scripture that was talking about Jesus, and you'll find out that there wasn't a whole lot where he was sitting there patting their head and trying to soothe them or calm them down. Uh, basically, he was always out front directing them, correcting them, instructing them, uh, displaying what it was. I mean, there was this whole thing going on, but it wasn't a whole lot of, oh, it'll be okay, Peter. It's okay that you sank in the water. You'll get over it. Oh. I mean, if that's not the type of comforter when we hear comforter. We're talking about somebody that when you're engaged, they'll come and help you. They, they won't just move you, but they'll come and assist and help to bring wisdom and knowledge. They'll, they'll come in and help counsel you and give you the best way, the things that you should do, the things that you shouldn't do, the things that might be hindering you or holding you back, and the things that might promote you or move you forward to achieve the goal or, the, or if the enemy's trying to come against you, then he'll also rise up and begin to take part on your, on your side to prove to you and to openly display to the enemy why the enemy's not permitted to attack you. Amen? Yes. So we have all of these things that he's capable of doing, and the more we know that that's present, the more we can draw from it. Amen? If you're driving down the road and you don't know you have a penny in your pocket and you look over and they got a sell on, on Burger King Whoppers, two for two dollars. Amen. It make you feel pretty good to know you got a five spot in your pocket with it. Woo, I'm in. But if you don't know you have anything, you can't use that. You just drive on by and say, man, that sure looked good. Mm, smell good too. And in Christ, a lot of times, we we just are really admirable of the Lord. We, are just, we, we get moved out of our senses a lot of times when we see Him lay hands on the sick and they recover. Biblically, if you can read through the Gospels and you don't get excited about what Jesus is doing, saying, oh man, oh, that would be so awesome. I mean, and, and really what we're saying is that we like, you know, Dr. Hudson like, I want that, you know. I want that happening then the Holy Ghost is saying, then let's do it. Yeah. You really want that? Let's do it. Because in our natural mind, we can do things to move us into a more focused zone for those things, but only the Holy Ghost can manifest it. Amen? Mm -hmm. We can put ourselves in the place and in the spot, but He has to manifest. But if you don't know it's there, if you don't know you can lay hands on the sick and they recover, you're probably not going to lay hands on the sick and then recover. It, it's just not going to happen. How can they believe except they hear? And, and that's the key, is that we, we have to be careful how we hear. Are we really listening to what the Spirit of God, what the Scriptures, what the living Word of God is bringing through to us? Or are we just gathering intellectual knowledge? At some point, we need to have that hearing ear. He who has an ear, let him hear. Amen? Because, I mean, there's times when I, when I finish ministering, I've heard from the Spirit, and I have to go get away by myself. And I have to go say, Lord, 
I need this. I want this. Bring this. You know, uh, we'll pray a lot of times when we finish uh, over each other, and we will uh, invite the Holy Ghost of God to bring the things that He has said into our lives. We'll do it right then because sometimes before you get to the end of the road, the desire for it's already been snatched away by the enemy because you had a pot roast on and you forgot to turn the stove on. You understand what I'm saying? Things can happen that can still the time to to really grab a hold of it is when he's saying it, when he's doing it. And and what Christ is bringing in us, the Holy Ghost, that counselor, that helper, that advocate is a lot more than just somebody to sit with you and pat you on the shoulder to get you through a tough time. If you look at Jesus, you'll see the consolation of Israel. You'll see what God sent to be the comforter for what was going on there. And and when we see that, we better understand that the actions that Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, did in managing and helping His disciples while He was with them and ministering to the people, that's what the Holy Ghost is in us to do. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus used this term four times in reference to the Holy Spirit calling Him Comforter. There's the scripture verses, John 14, 16, John 14, 26, John 15, 26, and John 16, 7. Uh, this word is also used in reference to Jesus as our advocate with the Father in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. How many knows you don't take your own case before the Father? Jesus is the one that has already made that intercession. Amen. The Holy Ghost intercedes on a daily activity basis while we are here in this world. The activities that we take on here and stuff like that, He's there uh, ever living and, and ever moving to intercede on our behalf. But when you go before the Lord, you can't carry your own justification. You better take Jesus's. You can't even take your own blood. You have to take Jesus's blood. Amen? He, he's the only one that that is acceptable. That's why we are accepted in the beloved. Amen? I, I can't appear there as, as Bill Hudson in the flesh. I have to appear there as Bill Hudson in Christ. In the Lord Jesus. Covered by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Filled with His Spirit. That's, that's the approach that we want to make. That's where the victory is at. Comfort, aid, and help are part of the nature of God toward His creation. I mean, all we have to do is look that God took care of creation for every put man here. He wanted to make sure all the provision was there. There was land, there were animals, there was water. All these things was there. There was light. There was everything that we needed. And then He put us here. Yes, yes. Now that shows the care and the desire of the Lord to be there for us. And then He made Himself available to man after He actually created him. He made Himself available to the degree that he would walk with them in the cool of the evening. Amen. Amen. Showed up in the garden. Adam, where are you, man? Get out of here. Got something I want to show you. Adam? Adam? Adam's the one that had broke off that visual. He's the one that was hiding because of his shame. He wanted to hide because he knew he was naked. Well, we, we a lot of times don't understand we're not naked anymore. We were naked as Adam in that line, but we've been born again now. We are clothed. And we are clothed upon with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're in Him, that's your outer garment, right? That's, that's the one who makes His, uh, put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Amen? So as we move into that, we understand God still wants to walk with you in the cool of the evening. He still wants to talk with you. He still wants all these things. Because God is a person and God's desire as may, in making us personal was to have that relationship, have that fellowship, have that oneness. But God is at work uh, with and toward His creation all, all a part of the very nature of God. God the Father is described as the source of and the God of all comfort. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. And also I've got some other scriptures. should be in your book. Romans 15, 5, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, Isaiah 51, 12, and Isaiah 66, 13. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now, depending on the translation you're using, whether it's King James Version, New American Version, New American Standard, whatever, NIV, it doesn't matter. When you break it down into Greek, it's all the same. God is the God of all comfort. Yes. Amen. There's nobody can comfort like God. That nobody can help like God. Nobody can is an advocate like God. And nobody's a counselor like God. And that's the very definition of comfort. Amen? Hallelujah. Where we at? We get to, yep. Oh, yeah. Time flies when you have it done. <laughs> Jesus is seen as our helper and our advocate, which is actually the same word, with the Father. Luke 2.25, John 14.16, uh, Philippians 2.1, 1 John 2.1. Hallelujah. I mentioned this already, where Jesus was anticipated is the consolation of Israel. In Luke chapter 2, 25 and 26, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Hallelujah. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Amen? The Lord's Christ was the consolation of Israel. So by the grace of God, and I'm going to stop here because I know we're right at the time, and uh, we'll pick it up here uh, when we come in for the next session. But God, just as He sent Jesus to be the consolation of Israel, He He actually revealed that through the Holy Ghost. But you know, the ministry of the Holy Ghost now is being carried on by us. He had the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that body has changed, but it's still the same Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. He's still out there doing it, and he's, he's utilizing and equipping us. What he needs for us to do is to hear and to believe, and then just let him do his thing. Amen. And by the grace of God, that's the love of the Father, not just to us, but to, to everybody else around us. And uh, anyway, let, let's stop it. Father, I bless you. I thank you for your mercy, for your grace. We thank you for all the wonderful things you do every day, Father. Lord, open our ears and stir us to get out of the place where we think we're already comforted in what we know, that we think we're already settled in what we know, because, Father, you know and we know that we don't know near what we should know, and what we do know, we don't know as well as we should know. Yes. Help us, Father, in every way to move on from where we are to where you are, to yield, let, and permit your indwelling teacher and the love of your Holy Ghost who's in us. Continue to lead us and guide us into new truth, new revelation, that we can move from, from where we are, seeing things the way we are at this point, into a greater position where we're higher in you, seeing a greater expanse of all the things that you've been trying to tell us and show us about. And by your grace, Lord, we seek that understanding to go with that knowledge and also the wisdom to make application. Lord, we yield to you and, and ask and command our being to let these things sink down into our hearing and let us be established in the truth that is present with us. In all things, Lord, may you be glorified as you truly are glorified in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Oh, would it? Take five, not ten. <laughs>